My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Today, we have a fantastic interview with Professor Christopher Atwood on Chinese historians who are writing about the rise of the Mongols as it is happening about a millennium ago. But first, I want to mention something. A friend of the podcast, Brandon Falls, he's been on the show once or twice way back in the BC era, that is the before COVID era. Brandon is doing some research to understand how language teachers are conceptualizing AI. They're doing a survey if you teach a language to non-native speakers, and I think it can be any language. If you teach a language to non-native speakers and want to help out Brandon, I'm going to post a link in the website to do a survey for him. If you're having trouble finding that link on the website, and I frequently do something stupid, uh, particularly when dealing with the website, shoot me an email, chineseliteraturepodcast at gmail.com. Okay, now on to the main event. I'm Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Today, we have a special guest discussing his book, The Rise of the Mongols. This is Professor Christopher Atwood. Professor Atwood, thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So you recently, I guess, in, is it 2021 or 2022 that this book was published? 2020, gosh, let me go just 2022, I believe. <laughs> no, 2021. Yes. Okay. Time has done flies. <laughs> It's been a it's been a weird a weird couple of years, hasn't it? Yes, <laughs> it hasn't flown that, straight. That's for sure. <laughs> so, the rise of the Mongols is a translation that you have worked on with the help of of some others that you mentioned in your acknowledgments. I, I guess I should just explain the structure of the book. So, the book is a translation of five different authors writing in Chinese. It's kind of iffy, you know what is Chinese, whether or not they identify, but they're writing at least in Chinese. Yeah. They are in different states that are are kind of existing as the Mongols, as Timujin, as the person who would become known in English as Genghis Khan, is kind of on the rise. And they're writing about him. They don't know he's going to become this ruler of one of the largest empires, what would become one of the largest empires in world history. They just see this guy who's establishing himself. And these are what they had to say about the rise of that empire. So you've got five different authors writing in Chinese, but then I would say a fifth to a fourth of the book is also kind of an introduction to the general period, which I, honestly, like I thought that was my favorite part because yeah. this period is so difficult to get your head around. There are so many different actors, so many different leaders, political leaders, you have these tiny states that are fairly large states that are disappearing and reappearing and and it, all kinds of stuff is happening. It's complicated because when you're talking about these, these, I'm just going to use the term, I know it's problematic in an academic sense, but I'm going to use the sort of common term, these barbarian states. Whenever you're reading the Chinese sources, you always have to be careful, but you have to be extra careful when you're reading the Chinese sources. There's just another level of concern about you know how honest are they being how biased are they being you started this book it seemed like from your introduction you started thinking about this book working under professor joseph fletcher right mm -hmm. what was it like i guess first joseph fletcher fletcher is a huge name in the field what was it like working under him i worked under him for a very short period of time and let me first of all say I'm a little bit, ha I'm very happy that you enjoyed the introduction, of course, because that is the most, the part that is the most mine, I guess. I, I do hope, though, that people do go on to read the translations, because I think these are great sources, like these writers, and I like, they're five different sources, and they give a real nice, interesting, very, very perspective. I do feel myself as, maybe I, I hope, was sort of like the I don't want to upstage my sources, but I'm glad you did enjoy the introduction. <laughs> and it's really interesting that you brought up Joseph Fletcher, because that really is a, a big presence behind this book. And the presence is that I started off academically. I, I got out of high school and I thought that I was going to either major either in philosophy or in biology with a focus on paleontology. <laughs> I took some classes. I was taking some philosophy classes. I, I wasn't yet taking biology classes. And then I also took, just kind of on a whim, this Empire of the Mongols by taught by Professor Fletcher. And he had a really unique way of teaching it, which was that he would only assign primary sources in translation. Even more unique would have been just to 
assign primary sources, but then the number of people who can read classical Chinese, Armenian, Persian, Mongolian, Tibetan, et cetera, <laughs> would be too small. But yeah, so it was in translation. And, and, and that was just an amazing thing for me. And so that actually, as a result of that class, I decided I was going to change my major. And it's a lot to put on one class. Yeah, no, it, 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 it was a life changing experience. So, and I thought about what, because of the biggest bulk of the sources, some were Chinese and some were Persian. So that was sort of seemed to be the sort of where the center of gravity. And then of course there was a secret to the Mongols, which is of course a, a Mongolian source, which was also very important. And, and so, but I thought I definitely want to learn Mongolian, but Mongolian plus Chinese or Mongolian plus Persian. And I thought, okay, maybe I should choose Chinese. Why? Because it seems Persians do a lot of translations. There's a big, a lot of big books available in, in Persian translation about the Mongol Empire. But the Chinese ones, I, Professor Fletcher kept on talking about all these Chinese sources, which were not yet translated. And I thought, that's frustrating. Man, my, you know, I, I haven't learned Chinese yet. I hadn't started Chinese when I was a freshman. So I was frustrated that, oh, no, I, you know, I got to learn these you know, Chinese words. So I figured I would learn Chinese because along with Mongolian, that would then, I'd be able to read the Persian stuff kind of in translation, but I'd also then be able to read the Chinese and also read the Mongolian, and there I'd be able to study this amazing Mongol empire. So that's kind of how I got into it. And in fact, when I became a professor myself, I wanted to teach a class like that, but I wanted to have a little bit more from the Chinese materials. So I started making translations of Chinese texts. And this began, I want to say something around like, I want to say two, 2000, I want to probably, so somewhere in the early aughts, you know, somewhere after like 2002. And I just started doing these translations and I would assign them to students in, in just sort of, a, I would just print them out on paper, but that was before everything went online. Then when I think went online, I would print them out in a PDF and then send a PDF to them. And that's where this came from. So I wanted to do that, make a class that would be like Professor Fletcher, but I actually only, I actually only knew him for, I want to say about, I want to say about two years. So I took the class in the fall semester of my freshman year. I began working with him, studying Mongolian language in the fall semester of my sophomore year. And we continued into the spring, at which point I learned that he was battling cancer. And as he was battling cancer, you know, the last class that I had with him in that spring semester, I would go to his bedside at the hospital, or it was in the, I guess it was in the medical I, I want to say it's down in the in Harvard Square. This is Harvard, of course, and I want to say I, it's like a medical building. It's there's this little tunnel that anyway I, I can sort of visualize it in my mind. But I've been out of Cambridge so long. I guess at that point they were doing mostly palliative care. It seemed to have been a very aggressive, very difficult kind of cancer. And so I took some of my last classes with him there, and then that summer he passed away. So. You know, I remember the memorial service and things like that, where many distinguished people came to to talk at it. So yeah, so it was kind of a kind of a sad a sad thing, but also I was you know it was like I said a life changing experience from a college professor. And I would say you've carried on his legacy quite quite well. I hope so. I hope so. Um, so the book itself, if we're talking about this rise of the Mongol period yeah. to a general audience. I think you do a good job of kind of hitting some of the main points in that introduction. How would you explain that in in like two or three paragraphs? Like you've got the the Kitans okay. who right, are right. running the Liao the Liao Empire. They're against right, the, yeah. the the Shisha, sometimes referred to. I mean, they're they're ethnically Tanguts, sometimes referred to as the Western Shah. And then you've got the Song Dynasty down in the south that has unified most of the Tang Empire, but not the northern part. I guess take it from there. <laughs> sure, right. So, so the 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 rise of the Mongols came in a time when when there wasn't a China versus a Mongolia. There was China itself, as you point out, was divided. Now, the originally there was a Song, which had unified most of of China proper, as the ethnic China. And there was a Kitans up in the north, kind of in the northeast. 
Uh, and then around at the beginning, kind of the stage really sets around 11, 11, 15 to around 11, 25, 26, when these people even further to the Northeast, to the Kitans, you know, were regarded as even more barbaric, so to speak. <laughs> the Jurchens sort of rose and, and suddenly conquered the Kitans and also drove the Song Chinese out of North China entirely. So the historic homeland of Chinese civilization was now under the Jurchens uh, and they built this Jin dynasty. The Kitans were interesting. They were actually kind of Mongolian, related to the Mongols linguistically themselves. The Jurchen were not. And the Kitans had control over Mongolia and the Jurchens lost control over Mongolia. So in the 1100s, in the 12th century, there was a kind of a vacuum of power in Mongolia. And the rise of the Mongols was a force, a, a new state, a new dynasty rising up to fill that gap of power in Mongolia. And that was the state that was led by the guy named Temujin, also known, came to be known, he's known in the West as the, the term Genghis Khan is, if you want to say, if you want to spell, pronounce it as Genghis Khan, that's a little closer to reality. The Mongolian is usually Chinggis. So that's sort of the, the, the most usual term. Real quick, we should mention that the Jurchens, we're talking about the Jurchens, those are pretty much the same thing as what would become the Manchus. They're called Jurchens at this point. They changed their name to the Manchus in the 1600s. Okay, sorry for that interruption. So Chinggis Khan, he rose, and it was kind of part of a very complex frontier interaction with the Jurchen dynasty. The Jurchen, they were ruling what was called the Jin dynasty, or the golden dynasty, the gold dynasty. So in around 1200, if you had been in East Asia and somebody was giving you a power politics, you know, your basic college class on the power politics of the world, it was like, there's the, the resentful Song down in South and there's the big Jurchens, the Jin dynasty in the North, which is the sort of militarily dominant power ruling North China. Along the Northern border of the Jurchen Jin dynasty, there's these turbulent, turbulent peoples that are kind of resentful and they keep on getting attacked. So the Jin dynasty would, every once in a while, would send some expeditions out into the north against those barbarians. They're barbarians, they don't really count. So they go thin the ranks. It basically means like kill a bunch of them and let them just kind of get scared of us and they'll stay subjugated. So what happened was that these Temujin, Chinggis Khan, he, he grew up in this thinning the ranks environment and he revolted against it. And he built up this new kingdom, which then eventually was able to, first of all, gain control of the borderlands and then eventually actually come in and start these amazing campaigns that just devastated the Jin dynasty, which was and devastated the heartland of North China. And so that was the first part of the rise of the Mongols. And so one of the questions was, what was the Song Dynasty going to think about this? And actually, for a lot of it, the Song Dynasty was kind of like, ha, 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 you Jurchen Jin, <laughs> you guys are such losers. Now the Mongols are crushing you. Ha, 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 ha. Because so, the, Song and, the Song hated the Jin. Right? Yes, they, exactly. They, they, right. The Jin had taken over the, the, the old Song capital. Right. Exactly. So there's this uh, in, in, in very uh, palpable sense of schadenfreude that the, <laughs> the Song writers and several of the writers that we're talking about that I translated are from the Song dynasty. So they start sending people to Mongolia to say, what's going on here? Who are these people? Very much somebody trying to sort of understand a new crazy new development that they didn't really expect. One of the things that comes up in the translations is this question of how do we, as a Chinese-style, Confucian-style governance, how do we deal with this new dynasty, these new people? To answer that, we have to go into what I call sort of the script. And the script is basically a set of ideas about how sort of barbarian dynasties are supposed to be, broadly speaking, you could say sinicized. But it's really important to understand that this is more about politics than it is about culture. I mean, culture plays a part in it, but from the, from the Chinese observer's point of view, it's fundamentally about state building. And that, so the, the, 
in order to be a good state, you have to do things. But the problem is you can't build a good state without being a challenge to any existing state. So the Song Dynasty writers have a, a very funny kind of dilemma on their hands. On the one hand, they don't actually want the Mongols to become, quote, civilized. They don't want them to become, quote, sinicized. They want them to stay, actually, barbaric, because becoming civilized, becoming sinicized, means building a state. And it eventually becomes quite clear that the Mongols have no intention of submitting to the Song Dynasty state. If they build a state, they're going to build their own state in their own way. And so this then creates a whole bunch of problems. So the final two sources that I translate are actually written by Han Chinese literati who are serving the Mongols, who have lived, were living in North China, came under Mongol rule, and are okay with that. But they, what they want to do is they want to transform the Mongols from inside and do that transformation through peaceful persuasion and offer as the, you could say, as the, the bait with which they hope to lure on the Mongols to this transformation, the fact that the result of this transformation is the Mongol empire will be the legitimate empire, not the Song, not anybody else. So we want to help make you guys the one legitimate empire in all the world, but there's certain things you need to do in order to do that. And so the Second two sources that I translate are ones that are written from that perspective. One of them is a biography, which is, they're actually both written. At a, and I'll say that they're both written and set at a time when the Mongols still have not conquered the Song Dynasty. So this, this unconquered Song Dynasty is a kind of a presence throughout the book. And in fact, the Song when Dynasty. You say Song Dynasty. I know they wouldn't have used this term, but we're talking about the Southern Song, right? Which yes, is right. Cut off by the the Huang the Huaihe River, or is it at the yes. Yangtze? Okay, it's at the yeah, Huaihe River. River. Right, right. You could call it the Rump State of the Song. Yeah, but they're they're down in Hangzhou right. as their yes, capital, and right. the Jin has been conquered by the Mongols, but it's still right. Divided. So the Mongols are restricted to North China at this time, but within North China. They've begun to recruit literati and, and to begin to position themselves as, as rulers of an empire, which eventually will be, which certainly regarded itself as superior to and dominating all of the surrounding powers, including the Song Dynasty, with which they had you know, interesting relationships. In the book and just now, you mentioned there is this question of kind of cynicization and whether it's about politics or culture. When I read Song sources, I always feel like there is this kind of ethnic anxiety or kind of an ethnic tension whenever Song sources are writing about non- Han Chinese people. But you argue in the introduction that a lot of what's going on is less cultural and mostly about politics. Is that Right. Yeah, it's real complicated. I, I think there's a lot of different things going on. But one of the things that I think is really important to, to remember is that kind of transformation, which Chinese authors are always saying that the northern nomads lack and that they should have, is not something that is in some sense good in itself. David Sneath has talked a little bit about this in his work on the anthropology of nomads, nomadism. He's talked about this as kind of a national populism. We tend to think that states reflect the culture from the bottom up. So, you know, as we talk, say, 19th century German or 19th century European thinking, you know, the German state should reflect the, the essence of the German folk. And since the Russian state can't reflect the essence of the Polish folk, the Polish folk need to have their own state that they can, you know, so you, you start with nations and then you, each one, they build up a state and the state's supposed to have their kind of that essence. It leads to today's confusion. In, in English, we use nation state as if they're the same thing, but in fact, they're, you know, they're right. technically when we talk, when, as scholars, we talk about it, it's quite different. Yes, exactly. So, but in the in the in the in the Chinese political thinking, the culture that matters is at this time is the culture of rule. So, if you don't have a king, then you can't be civilized. If you don't have a court that sets all these rules of ritual and so on, then in fact you can't 
have the fullness of civilization. These relationships, for example, of lord and vassal, these are fundamental human relationships. And therefore, they're essential to being fully human. On the other hand, though, there really can only be one of them at any one time, at least one fully legitimate ruler at any one time. So what that means is that the Song Dynasty, it's not that they want everybody else in the world to start, start having lords and vassals and having rituals and doing all these little things like designating years by sort of imperial slogans and so on and so forth. They don't want everybody to do that because if everybody does that based on the, their own governments, then you'd have all these different legitimate governments going around. And that's not possible. There's only one real lord, and that's the Song Emperor. What other people like the Mongols or the Jurchen or other people, what they need to do is they need to sort of just stay in their somewhat in their primitive, unquote, state and accept the Song Dynasty as the, the ruler that dispenses, say, an imperial calendar, titles, and so on and so forth. So that's what they're supposed to be doing. And what's very, first of what's very annoying is that the, and actually terrifying and, and horrible, is that first the Jurchen Jin and then the Mongols are not, are not showing respect to the Song. They want to build things all on their own and, and build a, a Mongolian style government and a, a, a style a government that's quite different. So one of the things that is, I, I hope people get out of this is how one way to study a given culture and politics is to study how it relates to those who are outside it. And that's a really, it's a really good lens with which to look at this. So I think people who study Song Dynasty, Chinese imperial culture and history really should pay a lot of attention to what's on the frontiers. It really should look at how it's not always a good thing if people on the frontier start like adopting Chinese imperial civilization, because actually that means they're building up their own empire, which is not a good thing, which is a bad thing, unless that empire is clearly subordinating itself to the central Chinese one, which in this case is definitely not doing. So that's something I hope that people get out of, out of the book, as well as also it's kind of, again, this sort of sense of it's always fun to look at something from a very different perspective. So you mentioned calendars, and calendars play a pretty yeah. important role. So I'm just thinking about the the first piece in the book, the first translation in the book is by Li Xinchuan. Yeah. And it he mentions, you know, before the Mongolians did not have a calendar. They just yeah. followed the seasons. I think he said something about they watched the greening of the fields and then they right, put right, out right, their, right. their sheep or something like that. That's not Correct, correct. No, it's not. No, it's not. And the hilarious thing is there's another source, which I haven't translated, from the Ming Dynasty, which is like about, about 400 years later, about 450 years later. And it says the same thing. They just started <laughs> start, started using calendars. It also says they just started farming. One of the funny things <laughs> is that you do see in this, as the these observers observe the Mongols, they notice that the Mongols actually also do farming. But they always say, oh, this is very recent. This, is, this hasn't happened and existed before. But again, we actually know from Mongolian history that this is Mongolians, even when they were predominantly pastoral, when they were predominantly herding and so on, they always carried on a certain amount of agriculture, farming millet in particular, but also barley and, and wheat and, and, other, and other grains. So yeah, so the calendars are so calendars are quite interesting because. The, the, to have a calendar is to command time, and to commanding time is a prerogative of the, of the emperor. So I guess most probably most, many of the listeners know the Chinese calendar is a, we sometimes call it a lunar calendar, but it's actually a lunar solar calendar in the sense that the, the traditional Chinese calendar, the months in it, or the moons as I call them, because they're actually real moons, the 15th of any Chinese moon or month, say, you know, the fifth moon, the 15th of the fifth moon, you can know that there's a full moon on that day, because that's, that's what it's supposed to be. Whereas if I say the 15th of November, who knows what the moon, you know, we don't know what the, the face of the moon is. So the Chinese moons or months are natural moons. The 15th is always a full moon. The first is always a, a, a new moon. But 
the it's also they're supposed to be a broad interaction with the year so that the say the 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 seventh moon should always be around you know sometime around like august as we call it so the trouble though is that the moon and the, the phase of the moon and the earth's rotation around the sun which causes the seasons don't actually fit mathematically you can't just like take a number and fit one into another and so as we know the the east asian calendar uh, therefore every once in a while has to add an extra moon an intercalation to make sure that the first moon or the, the the with the lunar new year tends to fall roughly around late june early february that's kind of where it's supposed to be right late january early february Yes, late January, early February. Right. If I ask you, when's the Chinese Lunar New Year going to be in 2026? You can't tell me. I can't tell you. But I do know it's going to be somewhere around, say, January 21st to February 21st, somewhere around there. And they'll jigger the system. And they have to do this kind of, it's actually fairly, very, quite complicated mathematically, but they'll jigger the system to make that happen. And but it's the, the emperor who decides who like it's right. the state that decides how to jigger the system, right? Exactly, right. And so the emperor kind of jiggers the system. Of course, he doesn't do it personally. And most he, yeah. he employs <laughs> he employs astronomers who work on this. And so, and then they proclaim this, and then following the imperially proclaimed calendar is your way of declaring that you are a loyal member of this of the state that you recognize this emperor as the person who has the right to control time. So that's one aspect of it. Go ahead. You mentioned in the book that even states which are pretty much independent in terms of their functioning, states like Korea still depended on the Chinese emperor's calendar, and that was how they showed their kind of subjugation a little bit. Is yes, that correct? yes, exactly. So if you, you can be the tributary status of Again, Korea is a classic example. You can sort of get a kind of acknowledged position within the Chinese imperial system by showing certain obediences. And one of the obediences is you follow their calendar. Let me say also that just before, so we don't exoticize this too much, the Jewish calendar is actually a, a similar sort of thing. The traditional Jewish calendar is a lunar solar calendar, has real moons, but also arranges it so that roughly speaking, Rosh Hashanah is always in the fall. Whereas if we're the purely, truly lunar calendar, like the Islamic calendar, Ramadan can have fall any time of the year. It could be in the winter, it could be in the summer, it can be any time. It just sort of circles around the year. Another interesting thing is, of course, how do you number the years? The most common way to number the years has always been by kings and emperors. And so, you know, emperor so and so, you know, year, you know, in the, you know, year 10 of Augustus or year 10 of, of Xerxes or something like that. And the Chinese did that too as well. But it, starting from the Han Dynasty, the Chinese got an interesting way of dating things. An emperor would proclaim a kind of a fancy title or a slogan that would give you what these years are supposed to represent. So I remember in the, the introduction, you mentioned there was one during the Jin dynasty when they're just getting pummeled. Yes, by, right, yes. Or was it the, the Liao dynasty? I can't remember. The, it was the Jin dynasty, yes. They're getting punished by the Mongols <laughs> pretty bad. So, and they, so they, but, they proclaim it like great peace or something like that, and that doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. These slogans are sometimes they're, you know, real, sometimes they're kind of aspirational. Uh, so, for example, when the Jin Dynasty, they've just been the first big Mongol invasion has just finished. And so we're talking like 13th century, 1200. Yeah, 1212. Exactly. 12, around 12 okay. February of 1212, they had had great peace. This was supposed to be year four of great peace. But now it's like, well, on the other hand, everything's smashed up. But, well, maybe, maybe it's a, Maybe we want to get lucky. So how about call it Exalted Felicity Year One? All right. So Exalted Felicity is going on. But by the next year, the Mongols invade again. 
we need something even more powerful. How about perfect calm? So it's a totally <laughs> calm time. All right. And then three years later, well, heaven seems to be unhappy with us because we're getting smashed up again. <laughs> so let's call it immaculate blessing. <laughs> so, so they give these aspirational titles. Now, sometimes, sometimes they, some of these titles are a little bit more accurate. So when the Mongols themselves start to proclaim these titles, so for example, Kublai Khan, when he rises to the throne, he proclaims central unification because he sort of wants to bring all the Mongol Empire back together and then you know, perfect prime and so on and so forth so they have these little aspirational titles it's a little like if we were to say like 19 say 1933 would be New Deal year one 1934 would be <laughs> New Deal year two but then at some point Federal uh, Roosevelt makes his famous speech where Dr. New Deal has to give way to Dr. Win the War. So <laughs> suddenly on December 8th, he might proclaim, ah, the, the actually 1941 is year one, win the war. <laughs> 1942 would be year two, win the war. So these are, and this is why I call them their slogans. And so, but they, again, once again, using these slogans is really important for following the imperial legitimacy. And so one of the problems my writers have is because they're they're from the Sung dynasty writing about how Mongols are invading the Jin dynasty hmm. and so they got a little problem let's say they want to date things that are happening so the Mongols win a big victory their informants and some of them were had gone on diplomatic missions or talked to people who'd been on dis diplomatic missions to the Jin dynasty so the Jin dynasty person might say, oh, yeah, back in Exalted Felicity, there was a big battle and we really got kind of hammered and this is what happened or something like that. And so the Song Dynasty writer couldn't really use that Exalted Felicity title because he was having a different title, say, I, I can't think of what, can't think of what it is offhand, but let me just go. So if a Song Dynasty writer uses the Jin Dynasty political slogan for the year, it would be giving legitimacy to the Jin Dynasty. He has to yes. use the Song term. Yes, exactly. Term. So he might talk about how this was year one of exalted felicity, which is actually year four of admirable security, which is our one. Just as, again, and this was, there, you, these are some funny contemporary things for many years. If you were in an Arab newspaper, you would never read about the, the latest thing that the nefarious Israelis had done. You'd hear about the latest thing that the Zionist entity has done. And I remember having actually a, in the 80s, I, I don't have a copy of, I lost a copy of it in various moves, which is very sad. But I have a, a book from the 1980s, which is a description, it's a Chinese language written, published in the mainland in the 1980s when China didn't yet, did not yet have relations with South Korea. And it describes the Korea. It's a Chaoxian, Chaoxian Guo Shou Tse, handbook of Korea. And in it, the North Korean government and stuff is all described in a normal way. But the South Korean one, every single governmental title is put in quotation marks. The quote, parliament of, quote, the Republic of Korea passes laws by a majority vote or something like that. And they are then sent to, quote, the president, quote, unquote, of, quote, South Korea. It's just sort of look at all these quotes. But again, again, it's the exact same thing at that time to refer to the government of the Republic of Korea as a legitimate government would be disloyal to the, idea to, of communism. The, uh, or yeah, to the idea of sort of legitimacy that was under which you're working as someone publishing a book in Beijing in the 1980s. And that's going on in these sources because the sources that you translate refer to people in the, the Western Shah as like bogus princess. Yes, the yes, Western yes, Shah yes, or something yes, like, right, right, like yes. the, the, the what is the term the Chinese term is Wei, right? Yes, like, yes, uh, exactly. Yes. Um, right, so, yeah. so I mean it's still it's still going on. I mean, even and to be fair, even in the US, we occasionally will say the so-called Islamic state. Yes, um, right, exactly. You know, yes. And, 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 and I'm just like, why, why, why do you even need? I mean, like they have right, proclaimed exactly. themselves as an Islamic state. Not that you have to agree with <laughs> right, it. Right, you can right. completely disagree, but there's no need to call them the so-called or the bogus. It's just such yes. a 
it, it's so unnecessary. Yes, exactly. And it, 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 so it's it, not it's not unique to China. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I really don't. I tried in this to not exoticize this. This is actually very common. I mean, another classic example of it is legitimate people have governments, illegitimate people have regimes. Right. Uh, the Putin regime, um, uh -huh. uh, the Zelensky government, uh -huh. you know. And of course, you know, I mean, these are these are are are, are judgments that we make, and and we make them on our for for reasons which sometimes can be very good, and sometimes can be very, sometimes maybe not so good. And of course, they also change again. Eventually, Arab governments establish relations with Israel, and China establishes relations with South Korea. And you know, maybe sometime the the Castro regime will become the government of Cuba. <laughs> you know, in American in American thinking, these kinds of things these are are things that could happen. But what's interesting is the linkage that this has in Chinese political thought to culture. And again, again, I wouldn't want to say this is unique to China, but every every civilization sort of does it in its own nuanced way. So one of the one of my favorite writings is the last one, which is Zhang Dehui. Zhang Dehui is a, a guy from North China. He served the Jin dynasty as a young man. The Jin dynasty got smashed up by the Mongols and eventually he, he comes to serve the Mongols. He takes a job in the capital of Mongolia, the, the Mongol Empire at this time is still in Mongolia, the famous Karakoram, which you can go visit in, in Mongolia. Today, I actually have a really nice museum there in Mongolia. But they also have a subordinate center in what's now Beijing in North China at a place called Zhengdu, or the central capital, the old central capital of the Jin dynasty. Although in Chinese, they call it Yanjing, as in the Yanjing Library. Beer. Yeah, Yanjing Beer and <laughs> Yanjing Library for those of us who went to Harvard. Yeah, so 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 he's living there. It's a period of kind of a little interregnum, a period when Mongol the Mongols had this kind of elective monarchy, which was a really interesting system. But it's one of those periods when they haven't elected a new monarch yet. He hears this Chinese official hears that there's this there's this prince out there, a Mongol prince who seems to be really interested in sort of learning about what we Confucian literati do. And this prince, a guy named Kublai, he's just a prince. He's one of the many hundreds of princes at this time, the Mongolian people. Many of the writers are, are, are amazed by how prolific the Mongols are. They seem to have lots of kids. Genghis Khan, um, or er, Genghis, he's the most prolific human being in history, probably, right? He, and Genetically. Not really. Turns no? out that, oh, that okay. was, oh, yeah. So it, that, that, it turns out that, that was based on a preliminary research. They okay. thought this haplogroup, this Y chromosome type, mm -hmm. uh, spread sometime between 1150 to around 1250. And so they, they thought it seemed to be mapped the Mongol Empire quite nicely. It turns out that they made a mistake in the date. They, they went and they, they <laughs> geneticists did things. And it turns out it's actually about that haplogroup probably began to spread around 3000 years ago, which puts it oh, in the okay. early, early Iron Age. Okay. Um, which is not so yeah no in fact actually what Chinggis Khan's haplogroup is is now quite un, uncertain but in any case certainly many of our authors talk about how the prolific the Mongols seem to be so there are many Mongol princes so this you prince have one guy Kublai yeah this guy just... Kublai he's like the cousin of the emperor so he's pretty big but there's many cousins of the emperor at this point <laughs> he invites Zhang Dehui to come and I want to hear about this Confucianism business tell me about it and that's really his 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 mandate. So Zhang Dehui is invited to go to Mongolia, and this discussion is going to take place in a, a, a gear, what the Mongols would call a gear, which is the word we use for all, Mongolians use for what we often call a yurt, sort of, it's a, it's a, sometimes you can call it a tent, although it's, it's a lot more permanent than a tent, I like to call it a mobile home, it's kind of a mobile home, but it is really mobile, it really moves around, and so this mobile gear or yurt is where the, the seminar on Confucian, I don't know if it's, I guess you call it Confucianism 101. Eventually Kublai advances maybe to a little higher level, kind of graduate level Confucianism. So, but so Zhang, he wants to have Zhang Dehui come. So Zhang Dehui is a very observant guy. I like, I love his account because if you ever traveled in Inner Mongolia and he's first in Inner Mongolia, which is, you know, part of China today. And then later on, he goes to independent Mongolia, what's now independent around the area of near the Herlin River, passes not too far from where Ulaanbaatar is now in, in independent Mongolia. And then eventually goes to Karakoram and then into the mountains of Hangai. Kublai. When he gets to Prince Kublai's court, he starts to describe these interesting ceremonies, which they do at the, you know, the, the Mongols, 
are also marking the passing of time through the moons. And they do it with their interesting rituals, which are very Mongolian. And he describes, John Dehue describes them as being done with birch bark vessels and things like that. And they're doing libations of milk into the air and they have these sorts of things. And as they're doing, this Kublai prince is asking John Dehue, how can I make the, the spirit of Confucius dwell in this gear? You know, he's asking these kind of questions about what can I do? What would be the best policy for taxation and so on and so forth? A lot of the questions are about politics, but he's also describing all of these rituals that Kublai Khan is doing. What he's trying to say is that Kublai, he has a ritual consciousness. He thinks about things ritually. And that means even though his rituals are Mongolian, they're not Chinese rituals. Again, Chinese don't do things with milk and they don't use birch bark boxes and things like that. <laughs> that shows he's he's educable. He's someone we can he's someone we can we can who can learn. And as a result, therefore, John Dehui also begins to talk to Prince Kublai about the you know, about what is real Confucianism. Confucianism isn't about like somehow having some sort of shamanic ritual, maybe where Confucius can, you know, comes and sort of possesses someone and speaks it. No, Confucianism is about, about implementing good policies. As you know, Confucius famously said, don't ask about the spirits. The whole point of Confucian ritual is to change the thinking of the person conducting the ritual, not to contact something out there. So John Dehue is trying to get this across to Kublai, who seems to have something of a different conception, but is also quite receptive. So, and all of this is happening in the 1240s, and we know, the reader knows, that in 1260, Kublai, when Monka Khan has, has seized power, then when his father, Monka Khan, dies in 1259, suddenly the throne is blank, and Kublai is commanding a big army in China. And then at that point, that's when the support of all of these Confucian officials who've been reading Zhang Dehui's account and thinking, wow, this Kublai guy could really change things. And then he, he and, and that's when Kublai actually kind of conducts a kind of rigged election to get himself elected, get the Mongol princes also. And the Mongol princes also have their own reasons why they, why they like Kublai. They, Kublai has loaned them Confucian officials and showed that these Confucian officials can actually increase your revenues from your Mongol, from your Chinese estates in ways that are actually good for your bottom line. So this kind of thing goes on. So, and that's how Kublai Khan then moves the center of the Mongol empire to what's now Beijing, this Yanjing in North China, and begins to adopt something of, not the whole program, but something of the Confucian program. So it, it sounds like what you're saying is the last author that you translate, Zhang Dehui, is interesting not only because he has this kind of interesting window into a young Kublai, but yeah. also this document that you translated has a historical effect. Other writers in North China are reading it because of this text. They throw their weight behind Kublai to a certain degree, and that's part of him becoming the most powerful person in the world. Yeah, so that's part. Yeah, I wouldn't want to just this one text. Sure, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah, But it's a big part of Kublai's own public relations campaign, the public relations campaign of Confucian literati in North China. Again, who's who's using who here is is really hard to say. In fact, probably they're both using each other. Kublai sure. is, is is exploiting them. They're exploiting Kublai. They're exploiting each other. They're kind of happy about it. In, in the end, probably Kublai has more of the upper hand and he gets more of what he wants. But then he again, he is the emperor and they're not. <laughs> so that's always very different. Yeah. So it's no, it's a really it's a really interesting story. And in that story of Kublai is. The, the fourth one that I translate actually took place earlier than this, this last source by Zhang Dehui. And this was Sung Zhejun's biography of Ila Chutsai. And Ila Chutsai was a very famous figure, and in, particularly in, in 18th and 19th century writings about the Mongols. He was considered an extremely famous figure. Matt Mosk at the University of Washington is writing, working on a wonderful book in which he is talking about how 18th and 19th century writers in China, it's actually 17th to 19th century writers in China, 
began the sort of creation of the Mongol Empire as a, as a, as a topic in world history. And so anyway, that later on, a couple of years from now, you can have him on. And he'll talk <laughs> about it. But so what I the, the everything all about this Ila Chutsa is this famous figure who sort of civilizes the Mongols is kind of how the Chinese spin it. His biography, which was a surviving biography, which was written by Sun Zhejun, is a classic of this of this genre, in which you know he's he's this valiant Confucian literatus who has to somehow get the Mongols to really adopt the Chinese way of governing. But what's interesting is actually a bit of a tragedy because in the end, the Mongols kind of reject it. And they reject it for a very funny reason. This biography was written during the reign of Kublai Khan about Kublai Khan's uncle, Ogade, who was Chinggis Khan's third son and first successor, ruling from 1229 to 1241. So Ogade was the first Mongol Khan who kind of experimented with adopting sedentary, you know, Chinese ways of ruling is oftentimes it's put. But there's a real thing that in these Chinese sources, they don't quite, well, I think they realize that they just don't like it, which is that Chinese aren't the only people who have a sedentary taxation agenda on offer. Because the Mongols didn't just conquer China, right? They also conquered Central Asia and much of the Middle East. And by this time, by time of Okade, they're sort of ruling Iran. And there are Iranian literati, people, Muslims, who have, you know, had generations writing poetry and serving, serving sultans and so on and, and other rulers, just like the Chinese literati. And so Kub Ila Chutsai, uh, Sung Zijun is telling the story about how Ila Chutsai is just getting Ogade to finally adopt the, you know, the, the doctrines of Confucius. And suddenly all these Islamic officials come up and start saying, no, 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 you don't want to do it that way. You know, Confucianism, <laughs> they have their way of doing taxation, but there's another way you can do it. Like one big debate that comes up is the question of if you have a married son living with his father, is that one household or two? In the Persian way, which also fits the sort of Mongolian way, that's two households. Basically, each married man is the head of a separate household. But Ila Chutsai is saying, no, 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 no. In China, we've never done it that way. We always encourage the family to stay together. So the married son is part of the same household. And actually, actually though, if you look at Chinese history, it's the He's kind of lying to the Mongols. The Chinese haven't always done it that way. Some <laughs> dynasties do it that way. Some dynasties do it a different way. So he's, he's not really being quite frank with the Mongols. He's kind of pushing a Chinese tradition that he feels will like actually reduce Mongol tax rates somewhat by allowing people to stay, stay together. There's a lot of interesting wrinkles there. So as a result, it's kind of almost a love triangle that results where you have the Mongol ruler, you have the lovely but rejected Confucian literati, who are the orthodox, the legitimate wife, and then you have these seductive temptresses from Persia and, and Central Asia who are pursuing, who are tempting the Mongols with a completely different, not actually that completely different, somewhat different, but not actually that completely different agenda. And so you get this kind of love triangle dynamic, which, and what's interesting about this is that Sun Zijun is talking about this love tri triangle dynamic at Ogade's court, because the same dynamic actually ended up playing out at Kublai Khan's court. One of the things we often don't remember is that Kublai Khan had lots of people from the Islamic world, from the Christian world, like Syriac and Armenian Christians and so on, serving him. And people from, you know, from as far away as they even had a, a small Russian guard or a Ruthenian guard, Oros at that time would have been East Slavs in general, not necessarily Russian, Ukrainians or, you know, the ancestors of present day Ukrainians and so on. You know, he had various guards of almost every different ethnic group from his empire. And so the Confucians, they always felt so frustrated because they couldn't turn it into me, the Confucian literatus, and you, the you know, crude, somewhat admirable, but ultimately not very well-educated Mongol. And I will teach you. There's always other people who are trying to teach them different things. 
coming in. <laughs> and ultimately, poor Ila Chutsai, who's been trying to educate Ogede, it ultimately kind of fails. It's a very quite it's a quite tragic sort of story. And I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting story because some of the earlier writers, the Song Dynasty writers, they know this Ila Chutsai guy. They know him. They they know what he has been trying to do for the Mongols. And yet they're they're not super supportive of it because again, Ila Chutsai is helping to build up the Mongols. They're Song Dynasty people. So they're Song Dynasty writers. So, and from their point of view, building up the Mongols is wrong. At some point, one of the Song writers, Xu Ting, uh, records that Ila Chutsai says to him, just so you don't get the idea that Ila Chutsai is like, you know, doesn't want the, the Mongols to win. Ila Chutsai tells the Song Dynasty writers. If our dynasty, he means the Mongols, if our dynasty's horses need to go up to heaven, they will go up to heaven. If they need to go under the through, under the earth, they will go under the earth. Basically, what he means is you will not escape us. You Song dynasty, you will not escape us. So Ila Chutsai is very confident that the Mongols are going to be the rulers of the world. And that for that, that's why he's working with them, not with the Song dynasty. Hmm. One question. <clears throat> when you have these... Chinese speaking writers writing about these other groups who are kind of competing for you you described yep. it as a love triangle which I think yeah. is a good way to think about it you, you've got these western asian and and kind of eastern european groups that are that are all around i guess first chinggis and then yep. but more so kublai yep. how how do these chinese confucians think about them like what what do they say well, so they're, they're, it's very interesting. They don't have a whole lot of interest in them, actually. And again, <laughs> well, they're, they, they're aware of them. But they're, they're sort of like – they're only aware of them kind of as stereotypical bad guys. Or when, they're, when, they're, when those West Asians are off in their own land, they're just kind of interesting and picturesque. When they come to Beijing and start giving advice to cons, then they're just like, guys, stay in your lane. Get out of here. <laughs> they don't show any real awareness of any of the sort of – you could say the high cultural traditions of – of of the Middle East or something. They're One not translating Persian poetry into Chinese. No, no, and they're not translating Persian poetry. One interesting thing is that they're they're not even quite sure what to call these people. This was a kind of difficult, or this was, took a long time. I, I think I I feel like I, I I was able to get a good translation of it, but it took quite a while because when the Chinese writers are referring to basically anybody who comes into what's now North China from beyond Dunhua, from beyond this sort of the, the outermost place of Han Chinese dwelling of China proper, they call them sometimes Huigu, sometimes, sometimes Huihui. Now, this term, Huihui, Hui, in the Ming and Qing dynasties, a couple of centuries later, is generally translated as, as Muslim. And so, you know, these are guys are all just, these are, these are Muslims. And so many earlier translations translate all three of these terms like that. But in fact, the trouble is also sometimes they're using these terms for people who are clearly not Muslim. For example, at this time in the the sort of in the area of what's now the Turfan and Kumul oases in what's now Xinjiang or Eastern Turkestan. So the Uyghurs there are still Buddhist, hmm. but they're still called Hui or Hui He, Hui Hui, Hui He, Hui Gu. So are they, you can't call them Muslims because they're not Muslims. And later on, actually, at some point, he's talking about the Hindu Hui He, the Hindu Muslims. Wait, no, you can't have Hindu <laughs> Muslims. What are you talking about? What they're really doing is looking at basically anybody who comes from the West. And also, probably also, and we see this occasionally in some of the sources, people who seem to have stereotypically Western appearances, deep eyes, high noses, big beards, maybe wearing turbans or something like that. These people are, are regardless of their religion, whether they're Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Uyghurs, it doesn't really matter. They all kind of look the same. Ultimately, these terms all come from Uyghurs, actually, and so it's a little bit closer to the original word for Uyghur than you know. You know they also have by this time they've also got a separate Chinese word, Wei War, which is specifically for Uyghurs ethnically. But so then there's Turkestanis, and then for some of these like Wei, it's just Westerners. 
So eventually I decided to use the word Westerners, which I thought was also kind of interesting because this, these are the Westerners for the China of the time. It's the people from Europe were not basically unknown to, to them. So the point was, is that they didn't, and I think it's important to be clear when you translate these terms like Muslims or something like that, you imply that there's some awareness of specific religions and civilizations, scripts and things like that. And no, there's not, there's, there's very, there's no awareness that there's something like a religion, quote, unquote, that differs Hindus, those, the, the, the Huayha from around the Ganges, from the Huayha in Baghdad and the Huayha in Bukhara and the Huayha who have this cross thing in, in, <laughs> in Kyrgyzstan and Semiretia. And so the Huayha who, you know, worship the Buddha in, in Beshbalik and in Turfan and around near what's now Rumchi. <laughs> they're all Huayha. They're all, you know, they're all the same kind of people. So, and, and so that's kind of a, uh, that's one of the ways in which I think translation can translation can be difficult but translation can also be make a real difference in how people understand the work and imply things again as i said both on the part of the author part of the translator sometimes it's better to imply rather than to directly state although i also then talk about it in my introduction so <laughs> <laughs> i have i have a hard time shutting up sometimes <laughs> it sounds like there <clears throat> there is very much a kind of colonial and imperialist element, the sort of 19th century British, French colonialists, the way they treat their colonial spheres, the, oh, they're all the same, you know, we're going to kind of pave over any difference, that those elements all seem present both in the Chinese way of talking about Western Asians and, and in a lot of this. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, we can, part of that is just, I think, you know, the, the sort of ethnocentrism preference for what's familiar and a dislike for having to be forced to sort out things that are not familiar. I think that's certainly a basic part of it. But then again, as I mentioned, it does interact with political doctrines. Once again, just as Europeans had a sense of that you know, only European regimes, you know, we British and we may dislike the French, but we recognize that the French are another civilized power. So Africa will be divided between us or something like that, or India will be divided between us or at different periods in time. One of the key aspects of Confucian monarchy is that your culture must, you know, must inform your politics. And what that also means is, therefore, if your culture gets it wrong, you don't have a political – if your culture is too different, your regime is not legitimate. And so that's part of it. At the same time, though, one of the things that you don't – I would say that you don't find in this, in this book or in the sources that I've translated is – I guess you can call it caste – sensibility where like contact with the other sort of pollutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, again, this is the most famous from sort of like Jim Crow and, and, and things like that. This sense of don't touch kind of thing. We must be segregated. We must be separate. That we don't, we don't find that in these sources. And there's certainly a, a very strong ethnocentrism, a very strong centering of the of, of the, sort of the, the Chinese way of doing things at the center. At the, and at the same time, though, again, people like Ila Chutsai and Zhang Dehui, they're serving Mongols. They're serving Mongol rulers who mostly don't, don't speak Chinese. So this interaction with Prince Kublai probably took place through an interpreter, although it's not really mentioned. And again, it's taking place in a gear. They're migrating a lot up, up and down the hills and mountains of, of central Mongolia. Zhang Dehui is looking at Mongol rituals and giving a kind of cultural relativistic interpretation. This is their rituals. Ritual thinking on its own is something valuable. So we, can, we Confucians can build on their rituals to create a political civilization that won't be exactly like ours, won't be exactly like what the Song Dynasty would have done or what the Jin Dynasty had done previously. It'll be sort of Mongolian. So for example, weirdly enough, the Mongols, they think the, the, the official on the right hand of the emperor is senior to the official on the left hand. Chinese did it the opposite. You know, okay, we can live with that. And in fact, <laughs> you know, many of the Confucian, the Confucian officials were willing to ad adapt to that. So there is a sense of there, there, there is a lot of ethnocentrism, but then also see a kind of cultural relativistic, a willingness to say their rituals may be different, but the sort of 
moral ethical, impulse. yeah moral ethical impulses that are supposed to be uh encoded by that ritual are the same this conversation i feel like we could continue for another two hours it's so fascinating and, and professor atwood you're such a great source and uh, of of this knowledge it's gone on longer than i had anticipated but it, it's just been really awesome talking with you i have one final question it's a little sure. bit of a curveball so you mentioned at the beginning you were thinking about paleontology uh, and you ended up doing work in mongolia and, and uh, traveling through through mongolia and inner mongolia one of the richest paleontological yes. sites do you still do anything like i mean does that does that is there like an amateur interest in paleontology sure amateur interest i've, I've always I've, i google now knows that i'm showing me write-ups of the latest new dinosaur from mongolia or morocco or anywhere is i'm guaranteed to click on it or a fossil mammals or something like that so i always i'm always clicking on that kind of thing but it's also found i i, I uh, in the last couple of decades i've found that yeah, a, a strong amateur interest in uh, zoology, botany, things like that can also be very helpful for environmental history. And so that's a new angle mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm working in. You may know if you look in the footnotes that there, I, I, I do put in a fair amount of effort to sort of identify different types of, of animals and, and, and different types of terrains and maybe a little bit more of a scientific direction than maybe some other, some other commentators might have taken it. Cool. I, I, have so many more questions, but I think we're going to call it here. Professor Atwood, thank you so much for this. The book is The Rise of the Mongols. I will put the the link to the page on the website, ChineseLiteraturePodcast.com. Professor Atwood, it's it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really had a great time talking with you. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye. I'm Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.